All right, guys, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're so excited to have all of you on this call today. Um, I think the attendance today really shows that this is a timely topic and one that everyone is interested in learning more about. Um, we have a great group of business owners, we have retailers, we have restaurants, we have folks from the service industry, um, like salons and that sort of thing. So really a good diverse mix of folks who are interested in how to keep their employees and customers safe through um, COVID-19. Um, so, you know, as businesses have gotten into the swing of things, I think y'all are all doing a great job of following the safety guidelines. So the real big questions seem to be around COVID-19 testing um, and when you need to do it and when it's appropriate. Um, so today we have a great panel of experts who can help you answer some of those questions. Um, we have Carla Coley. Um, she is the Director of Environmental Health from the North Central Health District of the Department of Public Health. Um, Spencer Hawkins is here. He helped us organize this call. Um, he's the Director of Making Bib Emergency Management Agency. Um, so he's a really great communicator um, to folks who um, need to know about these type of things. And we also have Grant Greenwood joining us, um, who is a partner at James Bates, Brandon and Gruber. Um, he specializes in um, employment, healthcare, insurance um, type of law, along with a lot of other things. Um, but he can answer a lot of questions related to the legal issues around testing and also requiring masks for service. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. We are going to do this as a panel um, with Q&A style with our panelists and experts. Um, so we'll be asking questions, but we know that you will have questions that we haven't thought of. So if you have those questions, please type them in the chat and we'll answer those at the end. Um, and we may call on some of you to clarify those questions um, as well. But if you could also keep your um, screen muted so we don't have a lot of background noise and everybody can get this information. Information, um, we'd appreciate that as well. Um, so with that, we will get right into it. Um, Carla, so our first question is for you. Um, when should employees be tested for COVID-19 or when should a business owner look into doing that sort of thing? So as far as the business perspective, that's going to be completely up to the business owner as to whether or not that's a requirement that they have for that employee being at work. Um, the only time we do not recommend testing if you're asymptomatic, um, or we do not recommend testing if you've just recently been exposed um, because uh, your body hasn't had a chance to build up enough viral load typically to show up if your exposure has been very recent. Um, if you were to call our call line and ask to be tested, they're going to ask you when that exposure was. Um, if it's been within the last two days, we're going to tell you to wait. Um, it's better to wait until the exposure has been at least 10 days away um, to give your body that chance to build up that viral load. So. A lot of people want to say I was exposed last night and then they want to go get tested today and that's you're going to get a negative result and that's not going to tell you anything. And so you have to be careful. Business owners have to be careful about requiring employees to be tested based on when their exposure was. Um, I think if an employer thinks that someone needs to be tested, they can certainly call the call line and say, hey, I've got this situation. Can this should this employee be tested at this time? And if they say yes, then get that employee to, to call and, and schedule or to go wherever it is they need to go to be tested. So it's just going to be a case by case basis. There's not a blanket you need to test once a week because you test today doesn't mean you're not positive tomorrow. I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I think it does, like you say, it's case by case basis and it's really kind of deciding what the best thing is. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what exposure actually means or how to define that? Sure. So an exposure means that you have been around someone um, within six feet of that person for more than 15 minutes um, while they were symptomatic or two days prior to them showing symptoms. So, um, for example, in a workspace where someone that's two cubicles down tests positive, if you've not been in their workspace 
you know, for more than 15 minutes, then you're not considered exposed. So it's less than six feet for more than 15 minutes while they're symptomatic or two days prior to symptoms showing. Okay, great. Um, and then I was in a call yesterday with some business owners and there was a lot of discussion about indirect contact versus direct contact. So could you define which each of those things are and how that relates to testing? So for us, a, a direct contact would be just that, the within six feet for more than 15 minutes. Um, indirect would be somebody casually walking by and that's not considered a contact for us. Um, so if you pass somebody in the grocery store, not necessarily a contact. Um, you have to be within that space. Does that mean that you could not get it? I mean, if they sneezed in your direction, coughed in your direction, maybe so, but we don't consider that a contact. Yeah. Um, and Grant, kind of related to this, this is a legal question for you. Um, can business owners legally require an employee to be tested for COVID-19? I know we've had a lot of businesses who as a best practice, um, before they decided to reopen, they um, wanted 100% of their employees to be tested. So um, is that something that they can require and ensure that everyone does that? Um, is it something that employees have to opt to do? Yeah, sure, it's a good question, but yes, the answer is uh, that a business can mandate that as part of a reopening, but again, um, you know, the, the, you gotta, to kind of to Carla's point, a lot of that depends uh, on the business and what kind of the nature of the business is, as well as, um, you know, testing availability, which, you know, because we're kind of going through a little bit of a, a spike or surge uh, in, in various areas, um, you know, it, testing availability may be the bigger problem as opposed to, um, you know, the, something that, that's mandated by an employer. But to answer the legal question, yeah, I mean, an employer can do that. Um, I would just say, you know, in advising my clients about that, really a lot of it depends on uh, what they feel like, uh, you know, they need from an avail, you know, how available is testing in their area. And then, um, you know, is it, does it make practical sense for what it is that the business is doing? Awesome. Um, and Carla, this is a question that goes back to you, and I think this is a something, Spencer, you might want to chime in as well. But, you know, in the scenario when a business owner or an employee does test positive, um, what should a business owner do in that situation? Um, what are the protocol that they need to follow? Um, I know that might be different for a restaurant versus a retailer. Um, what are those differences? You know, what is that breakdown by industry? Um, and what is the appropriate response? Okay, so it, I mean, it's actually pretty easy. You have to look at critical infrastructure versus um, regular workforce. So if it's regular workforce, it's not critical infrastructure, it's not, you know, it's not healthcare, it's not um, frontline employees, it's not food service employees. Um, if a, an employee tests positive, they are supposed to quarantine or isolate at home. Um, they're not supposed to be at work. They're not supposed to be going to the grocery store, going to get gas. Um, they're supposed to isolate away from family. Um, for at least 10 days from the date of their first symptom or um, three days of being symptom free. And that's without Tylenol or any kind of medication. Um, if it's a critical infrastructure person um, and food service is included in critical infrastructure, um, if they test positive, it's the same thing for that person to stay home, the difference is going to be how you handle the employees that have been exposed. So a critical infrastructure person still has to be excluded. Um, they still have the 10 day, three day rule that they have to follow, but it's the people that have been exposed that are different. So if there is a known contact with a non-critical, that person also has to be excluded from work. They're supposed to be isolated for 14 days. Um, and if they remain asymptomatic, then they can return after 14 days. Um, if it's the critical infrastructure employee, like a food service worker, healthcare worker, the contact to the known positive can, re can be at work. Um, 
they have to behave a little differently, however. They have to have their temperatures checked when they come on shift. They have to wear a mask while they're on shift. And once they, or if they begin to show symptoms, they have to be excluded immediately. So the person that tests positive is not treated differently as the people exposed to the person that tests positive. They're treated differently depending on whether it's critical infrastructure or not. And um, let me jump in here too about talk about the, the facility management side of it. And that's something that we're dealing with here at, at the county and we're trying to advise everyone on as well. And Carla, jump in when, uh, when you need to. But, you know, you have that person who's tested positive. They're going to, you know, take their proper precautions. You have those close contacts. They're going to take those proper precautions. But I'm also getting questions too about what about the workspace? You know, whether it is a a retail counter space, whether it's a desk or whether it is a food prep table, you know, how do, what do we do? How do we do it? And what, what we've been recommending, what we've been doing here at the county is um, taking, you know, the time, looking at what it takes to, to sanitize and clean that area, whether that's a half a day, a day, whatever it is, and shut down for that period of time that it takes to sanitize with the proper and we send it out, but we'll send it out again, the proper disinfectants and cleaners. Like the, the best thing going right now is, a, um, and I forget the ratio off the top of my head, but there's a bleach solution. It's literally bleach and water uh, for hard non-porous surfaces and wipe it down, clean it, let everything dry. And then once that, ha once that happens, once it's all clean and dried and you've taken the proper precaution with the employees, you can open back up. You can open back up for business. You can Continue to sell your goods, you continue to prep food, you can continue to do what you do as long as you take that small window of time to, um, to clean and sanitize that area. And for the most part, you know, depending on who it is and where they are, you may not necessarily need to clean the entire facility wherever you are. Look at that workspace, look at where that person spends time, common areas, you know, their work area. You know, if there's like a break room or a coffee room or, you know, bathroom, things like that, those areas so that you can do that proper sanitation. But most importantly, you can get open back up. And Spencer, I emailed to Emily um, almost like a flow chart guidance for cleaning and disinfection that um, would be available, I'm sure, for her to send out to you guys. But that's helpful in that too. Yeah, absolutely. We um, sent that out yesterday if you receive our emails and I just posted it in the chat as well. Um, so you can grab those documents there from those links. And when we post this video on YouTube, we'll include links to those documents as well. So you can reference those. Um, and Spencer and Carla, just want to shoot it back to y'all as well. You talked a little bit, Spencer, about having to close for a certain amount of time to you know, disinfect things and get it ready to reopen. Um, you know, what what decision or what factors need to be taken into consideration if a business feels like they need to close? Is there a set guidelines for businesses um, to close if they have employees who test positive? Can y'all speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and, and Carla, I'm going to throw you in here with me as well um, in the answer. But yeah, I mean, it's it's literally taking the time to ensure that wherever the, the positive COVID patient, not necessarily the contact, but the positive COVID patient works, whatever their workspace is in those common areas, make sure those are clean, sanitized, disinfected, and, and, and taken care of. And once, once that's done, because that positive COVID patient uh, will not be coming back in to, to reinfect or you know, to, to recontaminate that area, you're good to go. And so, you know, if, if you're looking at, once again, we'll use the, uh, I'll use the, the restaurant metaphor. I spent many years working in the restaurants. And so you've got the food prep table in the back. You've got your prep chef that comes in and, you know, dices and chops and sauces and does everything they're doing in the morning. If they come back positive, then you take that specific work area that they work at, clean, sanitize the knives, the equipment, you know, everything that they use, that they've touched, you clean and sanitize that, you know, the break room, you know, where they go or the office or the bathrooms, clean, sanitize all of that. Once that's done and that, that flow chart that Carla sent is going to be really well, um, you can open back up. And so, you know, it's, it's taking that, I guess, that, that common sense approach to where you are and what needs to be done. If you have an employee who, 
you know, has never gone at that, that positive employee who's never gone in this area of the, the, your facility, your restaurant, your business, then there's no need to clean and sanitize that, you know, because they may be, you know, in contact with that, you know, really look at that person, see where they're, if you want to take the day to, um, you know, clean and sanitize the entire location, great, go for it. Um, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily something where, and Carla, please jump in here, you know, that you need to completely shut your, shutter your operations until all employees are COVID negative. Um, Cause that's literally a window in time Right. When you, when you get your, when you're, you're testing and, you know, I may be tested today and then in three days I come in contact and just like Carla said, I've got to wait three more days and you don't know. And so if you kind of put that restriction on yourself to say, we're not going to run operations until every employee is COVID negative, it's going to be very difficult to reopen your business. If you take it as a step-by-step -step process based on each employee you're going to do much better for yourself. Carla, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say it, it, to sh it would be much more cost effective to exclude an employee versus shutting the entire facility down for several days. Because again, it's case by case. It's going to depend on when your exposure was. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of employers are sending their people to be tested. And we're like, so when were you exposed? And they're like, oh, you know, yesterday. And we're like, you know, but but they are saying they have to bring back a negative test result to go back to work. So in essence, they're bringing back a negative test result and then they're winding up sick a few days later. So it's better to just exclude exposed or positive folks versus shutting the entire facility down. But again, that's, that's an individual business's choice, you know, if they want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the, um, concern sometimes can be when an employee does test negative or has been exposed is the PR backlash that comes with it. So I know a lot of business owners, um, you know, are worried that an employee might test that and somebody knows that employee um, works for this particular business and then there could be some fallout on social media. So, you know, what 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 advice would you give for businesses from a communication and PR standpoint of handling that situation? Because I think that's where a lot of um, the concern about whether to stay open or not um, develops. Well, and, and, and I, I'm trying to channel my Chris floor here, so bear <laughs> with me. Um, you know, what, what you know, I'll say what we've been doing at the county to talk to our employees and our workforce, because we do have a fair amount of open buildings that the public come into to, you know, renew their car tags or get business licenses or things like that. Here's what we are doing. And once again, like Carla said, every business, every owner has to make their own decisions. But we, and, and the, we always, always, and this always recommend this, always default on the side of being honest. You know, it, it's going to, yeah, you're, everybody's going to know. We've got, we live in the biggest small town in Georgia, so everybody knows everybody. Yes, Johnny Smith was tested positive, or we have an employee that, you know, everybody knows was tested positive. Here's what we've done. We've followed CDC guidelines on cleaning and disinfecting. Um, we've cleaned their workspace. We've cleaned all the common areas. We have, uh, that person is following CDC and DPH guidelines, and they're quarantined for the specific amount of time. Their contacts who are either here um, or otherwise are following CDC guidelines and, you know, quarantining themselves and following those precautions. We have cleaned, we have dis disinfected, and we are continuing to opening back up. We are communicating with our employees, you know, if they are exhibiting any of the signs, symptoms, if they become a direct contact, like Carla said, not passing, you know, passing each other in the aisles at the grocery store, but that close, closer than six feet, 15 minutes, you know, then yes, they're getting tested, you know, follow, it's, I, we always push it back on, we're following CDC and DPH guidelines because um, they have been doing, it, and both those agencies have been doing a fantastic job of getting that information out and just being honest. And I say on the other side too, from the workforce side to the customer side, is, you know, getting that information out there saying, um, you know, we're, you know, here's how we're keeping you safe. You know, we're sanitizing all the tables. We're asking all of our customers to wear masks. 
you know, we're asking to reduce, you know, contact with surfaces. We're not letting you go to the soda fountain to refill your own drinks. We're bringing you disposable silverware, you know, just at the, right now, you know, you can't over communicate. And I've, and I've even seen where people are posting what they're doing and they're on their businesses. Here are the steps that we are taking for our workforce and for our customers. Here's what we're doing. Um, and just leaving it, and just once again, honesty. Carla? Well, I was going to say, if I could add to that, because we are the, the clearinghouse for all complaints COVID right now. Um, one of the things is public perception. That's one of the biggest things that we're having to deal with right now. So if you have customers in your facility and they don't see you doing anything, and then it comes out that you have a positive employee, what's happening on social media is everybody's going, well, I was in there the other day and they weren't doing anything. Um, so a lot of it has to do with also the fact that the public can see what you're doing, not just that you're saying this is what we're doing, but they actually see it when they're in your business. And that, that customer confidence is huge right now. And they need to see that the facility is doing something to, to protect them. And that's one of the biggest complaints we're getting. Now there's yeah. gonna be misconceptions that you can't do anything about. We try to field that for you guys. For example, I was in a restaurant and all the waitresses were wearing masks, but the cooks weren't. Well, the cooks don't have to. Um, the only way a cook would have to right now is if they were a contact with somebody that was positive. So we're trying to help get that information out. Um, but just perception is huge. And the, and the education piece is, you know, we got, you know, everybody knows now, you know, it's from the top of your nose to the bottom of your chin. And when you see it and when you see this, People notice that people, you know, it's a, it's a face mask, not a chin strap, or they see this, or, you know, people know how masks work now. And so making sure that you're once again, educating your employees on how it works, what you should be doing so that you can have that, the, the perception and the, the uh, of what you're doing, that you're doing things properly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, a lot of our downtown business owners are doing a great job of trying to educate their customers. And, you know, we've talked about this some in past webinars about communication. It's just like you said, Spencer, over communication, you know, post those things where people can see it, be sure that it's visible. Um, you know, I'm a preacher of the pinned uh, Facebook post at the top of the page with your hours and all those ways that you're following guidelines so that people know exactly what you're doing to try and keep your employees and customers safe and what the expectations are as a patron to come into that business and what you're going to be expected to follow. And let me, let me jump in here real quick, since I kind of talked about masks here. Um, there's been a lot of conversation. We're seeing it statewide about a, um, a mask mandate or a mandated mask order or, or things like that. Um, Savannah has issued one. Athens has issued one. I think Atlanta is very close on their way to issuing one. Here's, here's the conversation. Um, the Governor Kemp has issued, I think at this point, maybe half a dozen or maybe a little bit more executive orders about what can and can't be done, what they're doing, the shutdown orders, all of this. In each of his orders at almost the very top when the whereas, 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 he specifically states that no local government can take any action that either is more or less than what is specifically stated in this executive order. And so, because it's not specifically stated in the executive order, local governments are forbidden from issuing mandatory mask resolutions or ordinances or things like that. Um, it would be, and Grant, jump in here, you know, when you need to, but we, our legal team has looked at this as well. You know, we could issue a resolution to do masks, but it would be challenged in court in about 15 minutes and we'd lose. And so what the governor has asked for us to do is just communicate out that it's a good idea to wear masks and people should be wearing masks. But he has said unequivocally, and I've been on several conference calls with the, the, him and the state's team, they will not be issuing a mask mandate. Um, and we, we, we are not gonna be doing that there because we don't have the authority to do so. And so what we're doing and what we're asking everybody, and we're gonna start 
pushing this out hopefully really strong is asking our community leaders, our business leaders to talk about this, to lead by example, wear your masks, ask everyone if they're coming into your business to wear a mask, the appropriate personnel within your business should be wearing masks. Um, it is one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, the, uh, one of our conference calls yesterday, the PR director for the North Central Health District said it very well. And I'm gonna, I told him I'd steal it and I'm, I'm giving him credit. It's Michael Hawkinson. Um, he said that at this point, there is no medical um, countermeasure to fight COVID-19. There's no drug, there's no vaccine, there's nothing to fight COVID-19. We have to fight COVID-19 as this and washing our hands. So if this is the only thing that we have, we need to use this. We need to get it out there. We need to talk about it. We need to, once again, lead by example and tell people it's important to wear a mask. It's important to social distance. It's important to wash your hands. Yeah, and I'll jump on there, Spencer, to your point. I mean, that's, there is nothing that, that mandates uh, masking in the state of Georgia. And, uh, you know, again, to Spencer's point, these, these communities that have, that have mandated it, um, you know, I, I don't obviously don't represent any of those these communities, but um, I, you know it's, there's questionable legal authority for them to, to issue those kind of ordinances. Um, but what is not what, what's also very clear is that any business uh, is free to mandate masks for their uh, customers, employees, everybody coming in. You know that they're free to do that and. And frankly, I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, you know, I know uh, I get I get updates from companies all over the state of Georgia, and and um, I got an update from uh, Sea Island Company down on the coast, and they've mandated masks for everybody. Uh, you're sitting on the beach, and um, you know one of the staff members comes up to you, to, and you're going to place an order with them. You got to put a mask on. Um, you know, if you're in a common area where you're uh, in contact with other public uh, or, or staff, there's, you know, the Island companies requiring you to have a mask at the beach. So, um, you know, and, and I've seen that in other companies across the state that they are, um, that they're making, uh, you know, masks mandatory for everybody, not just their employees, but everybody coming in uh, to the, to the business. And that's, you know, businesses are providing, uh, customers that come in with the masks. So there's nothing, there's nothing that prohibits that uh, to, to Spencer's point. And, uh, you know, I think Carla would agree too. You know, it's, I think it's a good business practice at this point. Um, you know, I just think it's, I think it shows a lot of responsibility and, you know, even within food service, you know, you can still mandate a mask except while, you know, if somebody's dining in, um, you know, they don't, it's, you can't eat through the mask, obviously, or drink through the mask, but in every other setting, you know, before the food gets there, you know, you can, your customer can have a mask on. Um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, again, to Spencer's point, um, you know, we got, we got two methods to, to really combat this virus right now. One of them is hand washing, which I, you know, I do all the time. I, I, I don't think I've ever washed my hands so much in my life. Um, and wearing a mask and that's all we got so but that's kind of the legal perspective on it there's nothing that prohibits a business or business owner from mandating that for everybody uh, that comes in yeah absolutely I mean I think this is something that we as a community all have to do is you know set those examples um, I know that I've been a little bit lax when I'm just walking from my car to my office, but been trying to wear a mask more just to show that it, you know, helped normalize it. And I think that we can all do that. That definitely helps. And, you know, from Newtown side, we'll definitely start pushing more the necessity of wearing masks. Um, one question for you, Grant, from um, Chelsea is, do you have any recommendations for business owners who are willing and interested in, in requiring 
that their customers wear masks when they are one of the only businesses doing so. Um, from, I guess, what kind of context, Emily? I'm sorry. Um, this is a restaurant owner. And sure. Kelsey, if you want to chime in to clarify that question, you're welcome to do so. Oh, you mean in kind of what, what, how do they communicate that to, uh, to the customer? I guess, is that what you're asking? Well, how to communicate to the customer and then how to fight the public backlash when no other restaurants in the community are requiring the same things. Yeah. Um, I mean, all right. So communication to the customer is, uh, you know, most, I guess most of the restaurants that I've, that I've, um, uh, that I've seen uh, here in town, they have somebody that's stationed at the front door, and um, you know that that person may be doing something like uh, you know providing hand sanitizer or a menu or whatever. Um, you know, I guess you would have that person at the front door who also is you know providing a mask uh, to the customer and just uh, you know saying asking the customer you know politely uh, that. Um, we're mandating masks uh, at all times in the restaurant with the exception of, you know, when you're eating or drinking, um, you know, from a PR perspective, you know, I've seen, I've seen, a, I've seen both sides of it. I've seen, you know, people who would respect that decision. I've seen customers who, you know, might be more hostile, um, although that may be a strong word, but, more hostile or unwilling to do that. Um, I don't really know kind of, I don't know what the, the magic solution is for that. Um, I think it's, I think it's good practice. And I think, you know, personally, me personally, if, if I were asked to do that, I wouldn't have an objection to it, but I don't, I don't quite know how to, you know, how to overcome, you know, an individual's, desire to, or just absolute reticence to wearing masks. I, that's a, that's a tough one. I hope I answered the question, but it's, it's kind of, it's a hard, this, the second half of that, you know, controlling a, an individual decision. That's a, that's a hard one. There's no easy answer. I was just curious for your input. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and kind of related to customers, um, you know, I think there's a similar thing where businesses are doing, you know, they're a great job of following these guidelines, but, um, you know, if our public isn't doing this, then things are definitely spreading in ways. Um, so that's why masks are so important. Um, one question that someone had was, and this is for you, Carla, um, would you consider a restaurant guest who spends two hours within a confined restaurant space and comes into contact with multiple staff members in indirect contact? Or how would you define that person? So assuming that the facility is still adhering to the social distancing so that the tables are physically separate, um, the only person that we would consider a contact at that point would be the person that was doing the serving. So the server would be considered a contact to that person. Okay, that's helpful. And related to that, you know, social media is such a powerful thing in this day and age for communicating with our customers what our practices are and getting the word out about that. But again, it goes back to what employees and customers do post about businesses. So, um, you know, some customers may post that they've tested positive for COVID-19 and then list all the businesses that they've visited, you know, within that time that they've been positive. Um, so do y'all have any advice for how a restaurant, you know, from, again, from a PR perspective might respond to that? Um, is there any response they need to take within the actual facility? Well, I mean, once again, my channeling my Chris floor here. Um, is, you know, once again, be honest, you know, if you're tagged on Facebook, that's, you know, Johnny Smith says, you know, I was at, you know, I don't know, uh, Okmogi Outfitters or Okmogi Brew Pub or something like that, you know, and I'm tested positive. These are the business I was at. And, you know, there was, once again, honesty, 
you know, thanks for letting us know. We're continuing to clean, follow CDC guidelines. You know, we, we, we require all, all customers to wear masks. We sanitize, you know, every table, every counter surface. You know, we, you know, have all our employees, you know, make sure that they're doing the cleaning. They all wear masks. You know, just going back to, you know, kind of owning it. Okay, we understand. Thank you for the, thank you for the information. Here's what we're constantly doing. So, you know, you wear a mask, I wear a mask, we sanitize everything. The chances of, of contracting or uh, communicating COVID, you know, drop exponentially. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Honesty is always a good policy. So uh, I think from our perspective, if we get um, a complaint or if somebody calls in and they've, they've tested positive and they say, we've been these places, if it's places that public health regulates, we make a courtesy phone call to those locations and just say, hey, I want you to know we had somebody call in, they're positive, they were at your location X date, just be aware so they can be watching their employees, they can clean that space. Um, so we just do that as a courtesy. That's awesome. That's really great to know. Um, and thank you for doing that. Um, we, so I think those are all the questions we had um, prepared today, but I'm gonna hop into the chat and um, start answering folks' questions. So if any of y'all have any other questions, please post those and we'll start going through them. So I'm gonna go back to a question from Molly that she posted a while back. Um, for healthcare facilities, what is the obligation to notify patients? All patients in the building are just in direct contact with known positive, going how far back? <laughs> That's probably, that would be determined by their regulatory agency. Okay. It's not going to be a, a, a public health. Um, that's going to be the hospital or healthcare regulatory, whoever regulates them. Okay. Um, so Molly, I think you, that's an answer of where to go and look for some more information. Um, let me see here. Um, this is another question from Molly. Would you consider direct contact with known positive 15 continuous minutes or 15 minutes totaled? So it's CDC doesn't break that down. So, uh, I mean, Spencer may want to speak to this, but my assumption would be 15 minutes total. And that's why if you've got a server that's going back and forth to a table, that's continual exposure back and forth. So, um, Spencer, you got anything? Let me come off mute. Um, yeah, I'd say probably 15 minutes total. And so, I mean, if you're going to go out to eat and you're there for an hour, your server is probably going to have more than 15 minutes contact with you. But once again, that's where the masks are important. If that server is wearing a mask and ensuring that they're constantly hand washing and cleaning and um, you know the patrons are wearing masks except when they're eating then your your chance of your contact goes down you know exponentially um, but I see yeah Caitlin's question you know how do you you know how do you do contact tracing for for customers um, it, it's kind of it's it's tough and once again and that's why you know, we're asking folks, you know, if they are going out in these group settings and, you know, going into a restaurant and sitting at a table and that that's, that's a group setting, you know, so that's why we're asking folks to constantly be wearing masks, you know, doing everything that they can to reduce that, um, uh, to reduce that, uh, that chance of contracting it. And then going back to, you know, having, having that conversation with your employees about being honest, you know, if you're starting to hit one of those um, symptoms, then, you know, get tested, stay home, you know, do the right thing. Don't, don't try to come in. And I, I know that's, that's tough and, you know, financially for, for a lot of folks, but, you know, we're, a lot of things are tough right now, unfortunately. Well, and to also respond to Caitlin, I can tell you some of the things that we've seen some facilities do, and this is just, we consider it a best practice. It's not a requirement, but um, we've had facilities that have had an employee that tested positive and if it was a server, they've actually gone on social media and put a map and said, hey, we had an employee who tested positive. This is a map of the dining room. These are the tables that they served between the, this hour and this hour. If you were, you know, if you were a customer, you're welcome to call this number and they give the public health number and then we field those we do that contact tracing in that way. So that's helpful if a facility decides to do that. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and if anybody else has any more questions, um, feel free to type this in. We're kind of getting down um, to the Let me jump in real quick, yeah, Emily. Please, Spencer. So, um, and I know the, I think it was, yes, Scott, uh, to your point about, you know, getting the, the word out and leading by example, absolutely. We're working on, and I put that in the chat, but I'll say it here. We're working on a marketing campaign um, uh, to start getting information out, to really start pushing this out and talking about it. Um, what I would say is um, if you have, as a business owner, um, you know, if you have concerns, questions, if you have something that if we said it would be extremely helpful, send it to EMA at makeandbib.us. That's EMA, like emergency management agency, at makeandbib, all one word, dot US. You know, uh, we're trying to find best practices to get the word out, to talk to people. If you know of something like, hey, if someone else besides me said this, and that's, I think, one of the conversations earlier, you know, if I'm the only restaurant downtown, you know, asking everyone to wear a mask, I'm kind of on my own. And so if we can find a way to pull everybody together, you know, mask up, make and bib or something like that, you know, I'm meeting with the folks we're trying to pull something together kind of a short term and a long term get a short term marketing campaign done quickly and then do something more long term but we'd love to see your ideas um anything that you have please send it send it our way yeah absolutely and i think um earlier this week uh governor kemp launched the georgia safety promise which i just included a link for that in the chat. Um, so that's an initiative that's happening statewide where businesses can sign that promise saying that they're following those guidelines of the governor. And then um, you get a downloadable uh, toolkit for social media and that sort of thing, um, as well as signs. So if you need those that talk about social distancing and that sort of thing, that's a really great resource. Um, so I'd encourage y'all to sign up for that. Um, and there's also a customer pledge. So um, that's something we'll start promoting as well for people to sign up and remember to wear those masks and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, to your point, Senator, I think it's really important for us as downtown, um, we have to think of ourselves as a district, so the decisions that we make individually often affect the, our neighbors and businesses around us. So, you know, as you're making these decisions and coming in um, contact with these councils, just think about that. We are always here to help. Um, so reach out to us if you are, you know, trying to figure out what the next best step is. We're happy to talk with you about that. Um, and, you know, I think we can continue to talk in our Facebook group about what we can do as a united front to, you know, keep everyone safe as best we can. Um, not just our employees and customers, but what we can do to um, promote these messages to the public. Um, so unless anybody else has any other questions, I think that's all we have for today. Um, um, real quick, sorry, Emily, I threw in the chat, um, our direct, our main line um, here at Make and Bib EMA, the email, the EMA at Make and Bib .us goes to my, me and my entire staff. If you have specific questions, I know it's kind of tough in this format. If you have specific questions about your business, how you're doing things, if anything like that, please, 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 call me contact us you know if it's something that's more of a public health thing i can get you in touch with carla we can i can find you the right person to talk to um to figure this out um and i think the the only way that we're all going to get through this and still a have our sanity at the end of it and b have some sort of an economy and you know get out on the other side is if we talk to each other we keep communicating and we keep making sure that everyone else is what we're doing works with everyone else and we're all doing okay. Um, that's how it's going to work. And so my number's out there, please use it. Um, please email me. Um, you know, I, I know a few of you, I don't know everybody, but you know, I, I, I live here. I work here. I love making, I want to see it. You know, I really want to see it thrive and get through this. So please, please, um, anything you need, we're here for you. Um, thank you so much, Spencer. And Carla and Grant, do y'all have any closing thoughts or anything else that we didn't touch on that you'd like to share? Not to put y'all on the spot. 
Uh, no, I mean, just to, to kind of dispenser's point, though, um, and I can throw my email address on the chat as well, but anybody has any questions, you know, from a you know, legal standpoint, I'm certainly happy to answer and talk through them. Um, you know, one of the things that we didn't really talk about it, but I did want to put it kind of put it out there is uh, that the General Assembly is you know, passed, and I guess we're waiting on the governor's signature for it, but there is a liability shield law that's out there as well to kind of protect businesses and, and um, you know, who are having to deal with COVID liability claims, potentially, uh, those have started percolating nationwide. And so, you know, Georgia has, has joined uh, the, the growing number of states, it seems like, who are enacting these liability shields. And, and part of what we're talking about and kind of what, you know, we're talking about with policies, protocols, um, you know, sanitizing contact points, uh, masking, uh, a lot of it goes to, you know, the, the protection that now, you know, pretty soon will be uh, state law uh, to protect businesses from those kind of claims that that can come on the back end from um, from somebody who uh, you know contracts the virus. So um, again, I'm happy to happy to answer questions about that, and I will put my email address in the chat so that everybody can um, can have that. Yeah, and we'll share that with y'all as well too through our emails um, for sure. Um, and just one final question: um, someone asked and I saw Spencer already responded to it, um, but if there's a way to coordinate a similar sort of panel on a news station so we can better educate the public. So I think, you know, that's something that Spencer seems interested in. We can definitely talk about that and see if there's a way to get that done. I know we have somebody from a news station or two media outlet um, folks on here today. So, um, and Carla just posted her email as well if you have any questions, so. Thank y'all so much. Thank you for taking time. Um, Grant, Carl, and Spencer, this was super helpful. I know I learned a lot today, and I hope um, all of our business owners did as well. And just want to say to our business owners and encourage y'all, you're doing a great job. Um, keep up the good work. I know this is one of the biggest challenges we'll probably ever face. Um, at least I hope so, <laughs> for sure. So, um, you know, just stick with it. Keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And if there's anything that we can do to help. We are here for you. So let us know and we'll see you around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.